things are moving really fast. Uh, and we know that, that there have been at least three schools that have been dealing with transmission of COVID at the school itself. Uh, so I think we can expect more cases as we go on. But the last time we spoke, you said that you were confident in the school reentry plan. What would it take for you to say the reentry plan isn't working? Is there a number of cases or a number of schools that are affected that, that would make you change your mind? Well, um, and, and I, I would still reiterate that um, the plan is working. Um, the uh, cases are being identified. We're dealing with the, with the cases. Uh, we have Alberta Health investigating. Uh, we have a very quick turnaround in terms of uh, um, those students, those staff members uh, being able to isolate and, and isolating the close contacts of the individuals as well. And, uh, right now we have 85 confirmed student cases in our schools. That's out of 717,600 students. So still a very, very small number, point, uh, I believe it's 0.012%. And we have eight staff members out of 90,000 staff members. And again, a 0.009%. So still, um, you know, from what I'm, you know, we're in constant contact with Dr. Hinshaw and her team and they still feel very confident in our reentry plan. So just to be clear, there's no hard line for uh, where the province would decide to switch, for example, to scenario two or scenario three. It's a wait and see and discuss it with Hinshaw. Um, it will certainly be a, um, a conversation with Dr. Hinshaw and her team. Uh, we've said all along it's within the reentry plan that uh, we would monitor it closely. Um, it will depend on many factors. It will depend on where the transmission is occurring. Is it occurring within the school? Is it occurring without, um, outside of the school? Is there a lot of transmission in, with, even within the school occurring? Is it isolated to one classroom? Is it a broader um, or is it a broader region? Area. Do we have a hot spot in a particular region or a particular um, location? So um, Dr. Hinshaw and uh, in consultation with ourselves have felt we need to uh, um, look at this case by case and it will be a case by case decision whether we go into a different scenario in a particular school or in a particular location. And as always, then when you look at our reentry plan, we have the option to go to a scenario two, which basically, if, if I could simplify it, would be half the students attending half the time, or we can go to a scenario three where it would be going to uh, returning to a at home, full at home learning, um, teacher directed at home learning, which is what we did in March. And I, I want to touch on a recent Alberta Teachers Association survey um, that showed that an overwhelming number of teachers and, and school staff are feeling anxious and stressed uh, in a way that, that's unsustainable. What is this ministry doing to support them and what could they do to help in the future? What, what are some of the plans around that? Of course, we're always concerned about our, our teachers and, and the, um, the workload that they have. So we are in, in um, consultation with the Alberta Teachers Association. I have weekly meetings with all the education partners where I hear from them. Um, and I, I would say that, you know, it's natural. We're all very anxious these early days. Um, I have, um, you know, uh, friends and family members that are teachers. And uh, so I, I hear from them as well. We will continue to work with our education partners partners, particularly the Alberta Teachers Association and our teachers, uh, to ensure whatever we can do to, to help ease that workload and to, um, to bring um, more routine to the system in, in terms of, um, you know, that they're able to adjust in, in a, a, a better manner. What would some possible supports be for teachers who are saying that they're overwhelmingly stressed and anxious right now? What are some of the things that school boards are suggesting or that you're hearing from them? Well, you know what, I, I know uh, school boards are looking at all their different options and, and certainly, um, you know, it varies across the province because there are different needs across the province. Things that I'm hearing is they're certainly looking at uh, adding additional uh, teaching supports, uh, whether it's teachers or support staff, uh, looking at um, how they can uh, uh, even change the schedule times, those type of things. Um, we're, we're still very early days yet. Um, you know, I'm hearing from certain areas that, uh, you know, 
know, we, there's still some online issues, uh, getting students online. Everyone's working together to really make the system a, a great system, um, you know, in, in a very tough situation. And, and I really want to give a shout out to our teachers and our administrators who are working incredibly hard to ensure that, um, you know, as little issues crop up here and there, that they're able to address those issues and uh, really work together to um, to ensure that everybody has a positive, as positive an experience as possible, you know, given, as I said earlier, that we're still very early days. You mentioned uh, some of the snags that, that some school boards have run into with online learning. What are some of the things you're working on to, to help assist with that? Because we've, we've, we've heard that that some students just can't get online to do their online learning. From a provincial perspective, we, we are constantly advocating and working towards improving our connectivity so that uh, so that we have a uh, sure uh, method for students to get online and that that, uh, that is a strong uh, connectivity, not just in our metro areas, but right across the province, particularly in our rural areas um, where we're experiencing more problems. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, I, I know that uh, school divisions themselves are looking to sort out some of the scheduling issues that are happening. Um, again, this is uh, uh, things that they're they're working out. Um, you know, we, we haven't seen this number of students online um, before. And so I, I, I anticipate and school boards have anticipated that there would be a learning curve to it. Um, and they're working through those challenges as quickly as possible. You've said that if schools need additional resources, you the government would make those resources available. And I just want to give you an opportunity to clarify because in a, a recent interview you said that you had not heard from school boards that they need additional resources. Um, what did you mean by that? Surely you've heard from school boards that are asking for additional resources. And, and thank you for giving me that opportunity to clarify. I have heard from school divisions um, saying that they, they need, um, you know, they had wanted certain um, financial resources, et cetera. But what we're hearing now is the actual details to that. Um, you know, in, in, in the early days back in, in May and June, uh, we were hearing generalities. We may need dollars for this. We may need dollars for that. We may need extra support. We're not sure what it's gonna look like. So we had a lot of vague um, feelings that perhaps they would need something, but now we're starting to understand what the realities are. And, and of course, um, you know, providing the funding for those, those situations. What we've said all along, and I've said all along, is um, you know where there's a need, we will respond to it absolutely. When we looked at uh, when Dr. Hinchuk came forward with the masking um, uh, guidelines for all uh, grades four to twelve and staff members, we stepped up and we bought those masks. We ensured that every single student, not just the the uh, grade four to twelve, but also the, the K to three students as well, were able to receive masks. Uh, we are very committed to ensuring whatever is, is required um, that we will be able to provide those resources. I've been very clear with all the education partners on a weekly basis. Uh, we continue to work with them. Um, if there's a need, we will address it. What would those additional resources look like going forward? I mean, uh, a lot of school boards are, are really pinched, uh, particularly I'm thinking of Edmonton Public, who had to spend the vast majority of their reserves earlier this year um, because of a squeezed budget from, from the provincial government. So what are some of the, I guess, specific detailed needs that you're, that you're hearing from them? Well, um, right now I, I'm hearing from Edmonton Public, we're in, con in consultation with them um, to, to look at how they're going to utilize that additional $37 million of uh, federal funds that w was, was put forward. And again, I remind you, we're all, there's only one taxpayer, we're all that taxpayer. Um, as well, uh, they have, you know, uh, Edmonton Public in particular has, has talked about still possibly needing to go into the reserves, but we, we're, we're talking to them about that. They do have um, uh, significant reserves um, available to them. Uh, I, I just want to remind everyone that uh, overall, every school division in this province saw an increase in their overall budget. We had an additional $120 million accessible to them uh, for this upcoming school year. 
And as well, we've made major investments in uh, the infrastructure maintenance and renewal funding. And I, I don't have the number off the top of my head uh, for the Edmonton public particularly, but that was $250 million uh, across the province. Again, much of which could be used um, towards COVID-related items uh, as well. Total across the province, we have $363 million accessible to school divisions, and uh, we will continue to step up. We've already said there's a, a approximately three quarters of a billion dollars accessible to school divisions across this province um, in supports and uh, more. Um, and, and if you add in the $250 million of the federal funding, that's a billion dollars towards uh, the right now and more coming in the future. I, I take your point that there is more money in the budget this year than, than last year, but on a per student basis, it certainly is a reduction because we've seen growing enrollments across the province and uh, a lot of school boards are, are just squeezed by that fact. So is there something to look forward to in the next couple of months that can help boost uh, their budgets so that they can have the staffing that they need um, during this crisis? Again, um, as I said, we, we've invested very, uh, very much into our school system. We will continue to invest our, in our school system. Uh, when you look at comparing the old uh, funding formula to the new one, they're not comparable um, because of the fact it was a transformational change in the old per student funding model. Uh, we had included administrative costs in that and now that is a separate line item. So you, you really can't compare one to the other, other than to say, as I've said earlier, we have additional dollars of over $120 million uh, province-wide across this province uh, compared to last year's budget. And we will continue to work with our school divisions on what their actual needs are. Uh, we are hearing that costs, um, initial costs, projections, um, and I'll give you one example, that uh, busing costs, um, uh, to sanitize a bus after a school, uh, after a particular run, after one uh, drop off, originally was costing about between 30 and 35 dollars per bus uh, to to um, sanitize. Those costs, because of technology and and new uh, new ways of doing it, have come down significantly to around the the one to two dollar. Uh, amount per busing. So we're still at the early stages of determining what uh, what the cost, the actual cost that this will be to the system. And uh, as I've said, I'm in weekly conversations with all of the education partners where they continue to, to tell me some of their concerns. Um, you know, a concern that they have right now is absenteeism amongst students. Um, um, so that is something that we're looking to address and seeing if we can perhaps enhance the way that we're collecting the, the data in, in the check the self-checking um, for our students, you know, when they have to go through the, the list, when parents have to go through the list of symptoms that they're looking for in the morning uh, with their, their children. So we're looking at all these different options. Um, we're doing everything we can. I've got my department working full tilt to ensure that whatever uh, we need to address, we're, we're addressing it in a very timely manner as well. And, and I'm hearing from my education partners that they're very uh, happy with the response times from my office and, and from my department. And you've mentioned that you're you're constantly in touch with school board uh, associations and superintendents, uh, and that you're collaborating with them. Um, but I mean, critics say that that's not um, an open public uh, matter of, of record. We don't know what you discuss behind closed doors. Um, I'm thinking of the NDP who has asked uh, asked you to release the the target of their freedom of information request um, and to see what is being discussed with you and these education partners. Um, it, is there room for you to be more open on that? Well, I, I believe that um, you know having these these fruitful discussions amongst partners, um, I, I, they need to feel that they can they can discuss everything openly. And I am not, you know, I, everything is from my perspective. We we share the information broadly and widely. Um, it is nothing that uh, no one else wouldn't already know in terms of you know uh, when I hear from parents that uh, they really 
you know, are concerned that uh, the language around the word outbreak, uh, when particularly when it's only um, two students, but um, the the uh, anxiety and the hysteria that follows just that term, um, you know, that is something that we've openly shared. That's something that they've openly shared. So it, it but I, I do feel that uh, when we meet as education partners, we need to be able to have that free space to have these these very uh, frank conversations so that we can address issues. At the end of the day, it's about uh, addressing the issues as they arise and uh, ensuring that, uh, that, that in fact, our, our schools are able to continue the long term. Well, on that topic, I mean, when you talk to superintendents, it, are they really free to criticize openly? I mean, they, they depend on you to sign off for them to keep their jobs. You know what, we have such a, a great um, uh, uh, relationship with our superintendents and with our school boards. And, uh, you know, that's something that I'm, I'm very proud of is that open uh, collaborative relationship that, yes, I want to hear. I want to hear the hard um, you know, questions asked. I want to hear the truth of what's going on within our system, um, you know, because you can't address things unless you know what the reality is. So we want to hear on the ground, the reality, the, the um, you know, the, the, the good, the bad and the ugly, so to speak. Uh, we want to hear all of that. And that's what we discuss on a, on a regular basis. And, um, you know, because otherwise we can't address it. And, and I'm very, very committed, as is my department, to addressing the issues as they come up. So can we expect to see you at any of Dr. Hinshaw's announcements uh, in the near future? I, I mean, the school reentry is something that a lot of parents have a lot of questions about, um, and it, it is an important issue right now. You know, and, and I've had many uh, conversations with, with parents, the parent organization. I've had opportunities to Skype with them as well, and we are looking for more opportunities in the future as well. Again, uh, the, the health announcements are Dr. Hinshaw's announcements. Great. Thank you so much for taking the time, Minister. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Have a great day.